We're in a chapel. So can I, uh, can I confess to you something? <laughs> right? can, are, are, you, are you ready for this? No one knows this, okay? Seriously. Um, Word camps like to have original talks. This is an original talk. It's never been delivered ever before. And since we're in this holy of holy places, I'm going to tell you something I've never told anyone else. I delayed having sex for the very first time for one and only one reason. I was scared of my mom. <laughs> we'll come back to that. <laughs> Can we get to the picture here? How many of you know what that is? Yeah, I don't mean this other one, right? That, that's what people today think of, right? I'm talking about the old school one, right? I don't know if you have ever used a mop like this. Because the way it works is you take a bucket of water clean water, and you pour solution in it, detergent, something that's going to clean, and you pour it in there, and then you put your clean mop in, you pull it out, and you start rubbing this mixture of water and cleansing material onto a dirty floor. Okay, now here's where it gets crazy. You then pick it up, now that it's dirty, and for some reason, you put it back in the clean water, making the clean water dirty, which you then proceed to rub all across the rest of the floor. And what's even more crazy is that every time you're supposed to do this, when you take the, when you take the broom out, or the, the, the mop out of the bucket, you're also supposed to kind of drain it, which means it's not wet anymore, which means that you're then running this relatively dry rag on the ground, which is not very effective, so you kind of want to bring water out, but then you just make a watery mess. Turns out that you spend a lot more time, oh, in case I didn't mention, if you happen to leave the, the, the mop in the bucket with water just off to the side because you forgot to finally drain it out and you just left it there, there is an incredibly nasty odor that starts emanating from said bucket within just a matter of hours. <laughs> it's absolutely insane. And it turns out if you were to take a if you were to take a stopwatch and click how much effort goes into managing the mop versus mopping it's about a two to one ratio. You spend twice as much time working the mop than you do using the mop. A total pain in the butt. When I was growing up as a kid, my mom would ask me or my brother, mostly me, to mop the floor. Not all the time, because I was really bad at it. So what would happen is she'd ask me, I'd do it, I'd make a horrible mess, then she wouldn't ask me for several months, and then she'd forget that I had made a horrible mess, and then she'd ask me again, right? And uh, then she'd give me this look. Have, have you ever gotten this look? In case you grew up in a healthy, nice, happy home, this look says, I'm about to bury you. <laughs> That's what it meant in our house. My mom would just, she'd give you just a few minutes to highlight that she was going to hurt you. And if you could self-correct while you were only getting the glare, maybe there was a chance everything was going to be all right. But you had to be astute and you had to pay attention. This is also, going back to my earlier confession, this is why I was totally scared because at the age of 10, far before I was ever thinking about girls, one of our family friends, who was 14, got a girl pregnant. 
and their mother called my mother and they started talking. Now our family is Latino, which means that we can hear my mom talking with someone else from three rooms over, sometimes three houses over, and you're listening to her scream and she's describing in detail how she's going to massacre, how she would kill a son of hers if that happened in her house. And every time a girl went in and leaned in for a kiss, I was like, mm -mm. no, you don't know my mom. I was scared. I was scared of my mom. And you know what happens when we have fear? The fear that plays out in our head, it starts impacting our life choices. Do you know what I'm talking about? where we start thinking and we start worrying. In fact, we can put it up on the screen here. We start worrying about things. Everybody does this. We start worrying about things that are imaginary. They're, they're things in our head and we start imagining that the worst that could happen could really happen and the worst that could happen is actually far worse than what actually can happen. Do you know what I'm talking about? Somehow in my head, I got the, the thought that if I was even remotely looking at a girl, then somehow she was going to get pregnant and then my mom was going to kill me and then I would never see 15. And that's not how that works, in case you're wondering. That's, this is not that lecture, but I'm just saying that's not how that works. <laughs> but, but what happens is the fears we have, and everyone has them, the fears we have generate consequences in our head that are far larger than the reality of the situation. And yet, the fears we have, and everyone has them, play out. Because we keep them inside, they play out in terms of life choices. Does that make sense? If we admit, okay, if we admit that there is a level of fear, if we admit that we are nervous about something, we can step past it. In case you didn't know, eventually I did have sex. My wife was very gentle with me. It took several years, but now we have two kids. <laughs> That's the last time I'm going to talk about sex in a church. I just want to let you know, right? We're, we're, done, we're done with that little narrative. Um, no, but, but reality is you have to, you have to say, okay, this is what I'm worried about and put it out here and let people look at it and talk about it and work it through so that you finally get to the point where you're saying, oh yeah, now, now as I say it out loud, maybe it, maybe it probably won't happen that way, right? But we have to put our fears on the table. We have to talk about them. And you're thinking, wait a minute, this was a talk about our customers and our customers' customers and how does this have to do anything with fear, right? But look at these fears. Look at these fears. On, on this side, on, on your left, right, there's fears that I hear all the time, freelancers, small businesses, all sorts of folks that are doing web development, whether they're in the design shop or project management or development, and they talk about things like, hey, what happens if I sign up for a project and I don't know enough? I, I write a blog, right, at christhumma.com, and in that blog, I often will write some tutorials, some explanations, like, here's how to use this plugin and these steps to build this kind of site. And I will, I will come to a word camp, I'll come to an event, and someone will walk up and say, oh my God, thank you so much for this article. I knew absolutely nothing about a learning management system, but a client called me on the phone, and so I'm on the phone and I'm Googling, and I found your article, and I basically read everything you'd written to the person, and the client signed up, and all of a sudden I got a $4,000 job. To which my reply is always twofold, number one, Congratulations. And number two, do you need my address for the check? <laughs> Who here closed the deal, guys? Come on, seriously, right? But I'm like, I'm like, that's great, except here's the thing. You know what they're really saying is I got on a call with a customer. The customer asked me something I didn't know, and I didn't know what to do. And so I just started searching. I'm glad you wrote a post, thank you for that, but I just, I was nervous, I was anxious, and so I just started looking for an answer because that's a normal fear. Oh, wait, go back. There's still more fears here. Sometimes we worry about projects that never end. 
How many of you have ever worked on a project that never felt like it was ever going to end? The rest of you seem to be lying in the house of God. Seriously. Yeah, because the client keeps coming back. They use a term, I'll give you a clue. If you don't know whether this client is one of those clients, you're gonna hear the word just. And when you hear the word just, red flag goes up. I just want this, it's just this. And you're like, uh-oh, this project may never end. Or, hey, I did this project. And sometimes, you know, the client says, well, I have a little project to start, but if this goes well, I have lots of other projects. Or I have lots of people in my network, I'm quite famous. You can go Google them and see if they're actually as famous as they think they are. But anyway, I'm quite famous and all my friends will come to you as well. And you're still sitting there going, no one's calling. The phone isn't ringing. The website uh, contact form is not filling up. What if there's no more work? And so you can see this long list of things that we fear when we're in the middle of doing the work. But the reality is clients also have fears. And sometimes we forget that completely. Clients worry because they're paying money, not money that just suddenly got allocated to them. Someone didn't walk up with a duffel bag of cash and said, here, go spend it, have fun. No, they're worried if I pick the wrong vendor, if this project doesn't go right, what if I get fired? Or they're thinking, what if we spend all this money and it doesn't go right and we have to spend even more money doing it again? Or what if we spend all this money to build up this site for some sort of campaign and we believe the campaign will work and what if it doesn't work? And what if we don't get the business or the leads? They have all sorts of their own fears, right? And here's what happens. Our natural response when we're nervous about things, when we're fearful of something and our clients are nervous and our clients are fearful about something, we each try and go to the place of high control. We each go to the place where we can determine exactly what we're going to do for exactly the certain amount of money in exactly the time so that we know we're not going to get hosed. And what does the customer start doing? I'm going to tell you exactly how I want it delivered, exactly in what time, exactly with what qualifications, because I want to make sure I don't get hosed. And what has happened in that consequence is that suddenly we're fighting each other. We're antagonistic because we're choosing high control. And we're choosing high control because that fear is sitting in our head. It's not been laid out. We haven't processed it. We haven't figured out how to collaborate. And so we collaborate less. This mop that we talked about before, there was a company called Continuum. And the client showed up. Have you, have you seen one of these before? Do you think they're awesome? Is there anyone here who doesn't know how they work? You just mop once, tear it away, and drop it off. You know what that means, right? When you tear off the, the mop and throw it away, right? It means that you spend 95% of your time mopping and only 5% of your time dealing with the mop. Isn't that amazing? No more stink eye at home. Moms are happy everywhere. But when the Swiffer folks, or actually the company behind the Swiffer wet jet, or the dry jet, or any of the jets, when they showed up to Continuum and said, hey, we wanna figure out how to drive revenue and grow this and that, and they came up with this idea of, hey, let's re reinvest our, our, some of our monies into some of our existing products, let's double down and figure out how to improve. It was Continuum who said, that's an interesting idea, but let's do this instead. Let's dig into what's really going on. Let's talk with some of your customers. Let's monitor and view what they're doing. And they actually said, thank you for what you said when you came into the first meeting, except our job is to find the core of the real pain. Our job is to figure out what you should really be thinking of. And we're professionals at this. So would you let us go and figure out what's right here? And Continuum came back to them and said, here's our recommendation. A mop that doesn't work like any other mop. It's a mop that's a disposable mop. And people went, that's totally not what we asked for. And then they put it in some mother's hands. 
And they said, this is totally what we asked for the whole time. This was our idea from the beginning. We're so glad you helped us. Because the vendor in that relationship wasn't saying, look, I'll do whatever you ask me to do. The vendor in that relationship was saying, look, I get it. You got skin in the game. You're putting and reinvesting money. You want to have a win. We want you to have a win too. We don't know what we're going to find out. We don't even know if our ideas are going to be good or not. We don't know a lot of things. You don't know a lot of things, but we're going to collaborate together and let's go see if we can solve the real problem, which was the problem of our customers' customers, not just what the customer is telling us. Does that make sense? Every client has a client. Normally what happens is someone's doing business development, someone's doing the work, you're writing out the spec, and then what I hear more than anything else, especially from engineers, is just tell me what to code and I'll just code it. What I tell execs, and I coach a lot of CEOs, is if you hear people saying, tell me what to code and I'll just code it, which is another way of saying, I want no responsibility in this process. I don't want any accountability. I don't want any ownership. All I want to do is get paid to type. If you're hearing that, you should find a lot cheaper people who type. You should not be paying what you're paying if people are saying, I don't want to step into this. I don't want to own this. I don't want to have any accountability to this. I don't want to commit to this. I don't want to invest in this. I don't want to deal with any of my fears. I don't want any fear at all. I want to put a nice box around it. You tell me what to do. I'll do it. I'll turn it back over. And if you don't like it or it doesn't work, that's on you, not on me. I don't want any responsibility here. Instead of saying, look, I want, I want to win. I know you want to win. And what I want to do is collaborate so that both of us find the win. And that means you're going to have to get into it. Our goal, every single time, should be to delight our clients' clients. If you take nothing else away from this, this is it. Our goal, every time, whether you're a designer, developer, or project manager, should be to delight our clients' clients. Because when you are looking for the win for your own customer, that customer will come back. In my own world, and I deal with a lot of enterprises, in my world, it is five times cheaper to work a new project for an existing customer than it is to get a new customer. That's a five to one difference when it comes to the cost of sale. For me to woo and bring on a brand new strategic partner will cost me five times more than if an existing customer says, hey, I have another project for you. There's almost no cost of sale in that case. And the way I get them to return over and over again is because I'm focusing not on just what they want. Sometimes, despite what they want, I'm looking at and I'm asking the question, how are we going to delight your customers, not just how am I going to make sure that I deliver what you asked for? Does that make sense? All right. How many of you people remember these? I love you people. You're old school. I like that. There was a point in time when these things didn't exist. It was just Air Jordans from Nike. Nike. Reebok had been moving up and up and up the scale and suddenly Nike came back and threw out the Air Jordans and every different kind of Air Jordan and suddenly Reebok's like, oh, we're, we're in trouble. They went to a little company called Continuum. You've heard that name before. And Continuum said, look, we love what you're saying to us. We know you want to do something new and innovative, but here's the deal. We really need to do some deep discovery we need to do deep discovery, not just with you, but we need to go out and talk with some of your customers. We need to talk to moms. And you know what mom said? Mom said, I hate buying basketball shoes. You're like, how can you have emotional response to basketball shoes? They're like, oh no, I don't have an emotional response to basketball shoes. I have emotional response to the fact that I buy a pair of shoes for my son playing basketball at school, and within four months, his feet have grown, and I got to buy him another pair of shoes. 
And then four months later, I got to buy him another pair of shoes. And every time I buy him the damn pair of shoes, they're 78, 85, $95. And they said, that's an interesting problem to solve. How could we build a shoe that a person going through a growth spurt could still use the same shoe over a period of time, a longer period of time, saving you the cost of buying three pairs of shoes? And they built this. I don't know if you were around when the ads came out. The ads said nothing about moms will love these shoes. Because you know what? You don't sell shoes by saying your mom will love these shoes. There's no kid who was like, well, I'm so glad my mom. Other than me, I was always like, what mom wants? Whatever mom wants, I'll wear whatever mom wants. But everybody else, they're like, no, I want to buy what's cool on the playground. So they didn't do that. What they did is they went to NBA stars. And they said, hey, if you, if you were to push this little pump and get it stronger around your ankle, would that reduce any of the performance issues? And they're like, yeah. They're like, great, we want that commercial. And then they went and they paid to sponsor the guy who was supposed to win the, the dunk contest. And they said, can you put these on? And he, they paid him enough money, he put them on and he won the dunk contest. And every kid was like, I need the pump shoes because I want to win the dunk contest. But they solved the problem and this became a huge win for Reebok, and they did eclipse Nike. All because they solved not what the customer told them, but what their customers' customers told them. Does that make sense? All right. When I was a kid, the internet was books. Let me show you this. There were yellow pages, and there were white pages. How many of you old school people remember yellow pages and white pages? Yep. And you remember they used to drop them off sometimes in the driveway, and as a kid, you had to bring them back, and they don't look like this anymore. Nowadays, they're like three quarters of an inch thick, but when I was a kid, they were like five inches thick, and so just one of them was like, oh man, this is gonna be work. But that was our internet, right? We wanted to know who can fix my car. Open up the yellow pages, right? Ah, I met this kid, Billy John Johnson. Uh, how, what's his phone number? Go to the white pages, right? You didn't even know if that was the right one, right? You're just calling people like, hello, is this a kid I met on the playground yesterday? No, hang up on my, get off my phone. Okay, sorry, right? But the yellow pages, and, and you know what happens with the yellow pages, they were just lines and lines of entries. But every now and then, they'd have like a big box. That's who you order pizza from, right? The big box, because you're like, if they have enough money to buy the big box, then this must be pretty good pizza, right? To create just the single line, to create just the single line in the yellow pages cost $4,000 a year. And here's how it worked, right? It's very expensive in those days. Um, you would buy the ad, you'd pay 4,000 bucks. The guy who would come to you, he would sell it to you directly, like one-on-one -on -one meeting. And he would tell you, your local business needs the yellow pages because that's how you're going to get traffic. And so they would tell you, you need this, and they would tell you how many people use the Yellow Pages and how much distribution they have, and they would go through all these details, but they could never prove that it was actually doing anything because there was no way to connect those dots. It was just, you pay for an ad, and at the end of a year, you show up, the guy comes to the meeting, and he's ready to sell you the renewal for next year, and you're like, I don't really know if this is going to work or not, and he's like, oh, it's totally working. Pay me another four grand. But I'll tell you the truth. The four grand is just the line. You really want the big box. That's what the people that are making money are doing. And so he'd upsell you to five, six, seven, eight thousand dollars $8,000 for one year for an ad in this printed book. And you had no way to know if it was going to work. Now, in an eight-year period, from 2002 to 2010, we're not talking about like way back pre-internet. From 2002 to 2010, from 15 billion entries and uh, products pushed and published out, they dropped by a third. Five billion entries and published pages gone. Think about that. I mean, this thing was on a massive drop. And you know what the guy did at the Yellow Pages? He came in to your office like nothing had ever changed and he pitched you just as hard. And you still needed four grand, but on top of that, you probably wanna buy the big square. And he did everything exactly the same in 2002 and 2003 and 2004 and 2005. And he kept pitching the exact same thing. 
and a few less people bought. But this was worthless because people weren't doing this anymore. In 2005, people didn't even go to a newspaper to look up when the movies were playing. In 2005, they didn't call movie phone. Did any of you have to call a phone number to ask what movies were playing at what time? And then if you missed the time, you had to go all the way back and start the prompts again? Nobody was doing that in 2005. They were literally just going on the web. And this guy's pitching hard. Can I be honest with you for just a second? Everything about the internet has changed in the last five to 10 years. And there are people still pitching a straight, boring, ridiculously non-useful WordPress website for $500 or $1,000 that has absolutely no impact, and we've become this guy. You hear what I'm saying? No benefit, no improvement. Whether it's a restaurant or a small business leather shop or whatever, there are people who still pitch the same old school thing like, well, you just need to have a presence on the web. And this guy's saying the same thing. You just need to have an ad in the yellow pages and it's like magic. You just put it up there and people will come and that's not how it works. And we don't want to be that guy. And we don't want WordPress the tool that can literally do so much and have so much impact to get thrown out, baby with the bathwater, because of us. We don't want that. We want to make sure we're delivering value. You've heard several people talk today, right, about delivering value to customers, because that's what brings them back. But that means in order for us to delight, right, our clients, okay, we need to expand our horizons. It's no longer good enough to just say, I can put together that single page, buy a theme from ThemeForest, download it, put it on a host, just put it up, fill in some details, and then walk away. Because when that fails to work, they don't just throw out you, they throw out WordPress, they throw out all sorts of stuff. We don't want that, right? So, what I'm gonna do in my remaining time is I'm just gonna walk you through some different questions. I am not suggesting at all that you have to become an expert in all of these things. What I am suggesting is that you probably ought to become a little more intelligent about at least one of these things. For example, call tracking. I don't know if you know this, but you can actually sign up with an online service to get as many different phone numbers for a business as you want. So for each different Google ad and for each different place that you're sending people traffic, you can actually, for every single directory, every other website, every partnership, every ad, everything you're doing, you can get a totally different number. And in fact, there's a little plugin that helps so that when they see the ad with a number and they click and come to your website, they can even make the phone number on the website change to whatever that first number was, right? Because they're doing a cookie tracking. And so in the end, that person only used that number which allows you or your customer to know which leads are coming from which sources, which then allows you to know which sources are more valuable, which then allows you to determine at the end of a year when you're renewing the kinds of relationships and partnerships you have, which ones are worth it and which ones aren't. Does that make sense? If your client doesn't know this is possible, wouldn't it be nice if you're the one that told him? He'd be like, oh, this is amazing. I didn't even know you could do this. And you're like, yeah, I, I want, not only do I want you to be, I want your clients to be able to use whatever inbound entry of phone numbers they want, but I need you to be able to win knowing where you spend your money. And if you know that, you can make better choices and you can run a business better and you can generate more revenue and you do, the, you do that, you're thankful to me and maybe I get repeat business in an easy and low-cost fashion because I helped you go beyond just having a site. Look at the next one. All right, this is lead tracking, right? Person comes to the website. I'm sure many of you know this stuff, but there's some people that don't, even today, right? Do you know that you can drop a cookie on the site for the guy that came over and the person that comes and visits the site navigates through three or four different places, puts in a comment or whatever, you can take that content, you can attach the comment, the actual like his name or his email or her name or email, and you can attach it to their path so you can look at their paths and you can see where they're navigating and you can see which are the pages that are actually working very effectively and which are the pages that aren't. 
And this is like a free plugin. And suddenly you're giving better data to your customer and they're being able to focus better on which products and which offerings are working better than others? Doesn't this make sense? And wouldn't it be nice if you were the person telling them about it? Let's go to the next one. Lead generation. How many of you have ever been to a website where there's a whole pop-up that pops up in front of your face? Okay, how many of you hate that? Okay, awesome. My friend is responsible for all of that. And I, I, I love my friend, but I hate what he does, right? He shows me all the data that says it totally works. I believe him because he's not a liar, but I still hate it. What I appreciate is they've manipulated Optin Monster, right, in case he's watching especially. They've manipulated Optin Monster so that they can set it up so you only get the pop-up when you're leaving, right? That's called exit intent. And exit intent is great because if you're leaving, I might as well throw up a pop-up and say, hey, by the way, do you want this last-minute gift if you give me your email? Right? Because it's like you're about to leave anyway. What do I care? <laughs> right? I just don't want it when I get there because when I get there, it's like, you know, when you're first date and you're like, hey, what, what? so what do you do? And they tell you and you're like, great. What, what should we name our kids? <laughs> I'm sorry, what did you just say to me? This is our first date, right? And that's what happens. I get to a website and the pop-up comes up before I even read the first line of content. And they're like, hey, do you want to give me your email and be committed for life? And I'm like, no. <laughs> and now I just want to leave, right? But these guys, exit intent is incredibly helpful, right? There's recent articles they've just released on, on the, the, literally the number of different customers they've helped double, triple, quadruple, the traffic and the capturing of emails through using this product. If you have a kind of customer that needs this kind of stuff, we talked about the value of an email list, if this is it, right, wouldn't it be nice if you were the one that told your customer how it works? Does that make sense? Let's go to the next one, right? CRMs, there's a bunch of CRMs. I don't wanna get into a CRM debate, but if you don't know anything at all about CRMs, man, it's gonna be a hard time for you educating your customer, helping them understand the value of tracking all sorts of different things and when to send out emails, et cetera. Now, Agile CRM does some really cool things, right? Gives you a little script you put into your website and then you can start tracking anonymous people that you don't know, right? And you can say something like, hey, after they visited these three pages, I write a lot about membership plugins. So if they come to my site and they click on three different offers for membership plugins, uh, Agile CRM can pop up a little window at the bottom that just says, hey, you might be interested in this ebook. And you're like, that's amazing. You know what's even more amazing? Don't do it on your site. Do it on your customer's site. Because if you help your customer win and win big, they come back and they say, this is amazing. And Agile uh, CRM just came out with a WordPress plugin. Right? And you're like, this is awesome. Let's go to the next one. Marketing funnels. How many of you have ever heard of click funnels? How many of you know what funnels are? Okay, some of you, right? Funnels are horrible things. They just happen to be very effective, but they're horrible things because they get me every time, right? The, hi, would you like to buy this? And I go, no, I'm not ready to buy that. And they go, okay, I understand. You said, no, Chris, I get it. You're a discerning person. I appreciate that you're discerning. <laughs> That's why I'd like to offer you this at a much lower rate, but quite interesting, at which point you go, all right, I'll buy that. And they go, since you bought this and only for this one moment right now, you have the opportunity to buy this for slightly more money, but it's only available right now. Click now or you'll lose it forever. No. I get your hesitancy. <laughs> what I'd like to do is offer you this. Most people, and you're like, oh my, how did I, like I went to buy something for $7. I ended up spending $107. And you're like, I hate you, but it's good. It works. And they're only selling you things you click. It's not forcing you to do anything. It's just very smart people have figured out how to navigate you through a funnel. The upsides and the downsides. And if you know nothing about this, you can't offer it to anyone. Now, I'm not saying that what you want to do is offer stuff you don't know anything about. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that in order for you to think about your customers' customers, you're going to have to broaden your understanding of how the world works and how business works so that you can introduce more value to those customers. I was just talking to a friend earlier today. I totally thought that I understood local SEO search, right? Because 
I didn't think it had changed. So I'm like, well, you do this, you do this, and then there's Google and there's, it shows you seven listings. So the other day, I'm about to tell this to someone, and I went to do a Google search. It only shows three now. Did you know that? Did you know that Google changed it from seven to three, and then they have a little button you gotta click to see more, and that the map is now bigger, and that actually some of the way they get the data in there is through something called schema, which is a particular syntax and structure that you have to put your data into, and if you don't know anything about schema, and your theme didn't have anything about schema, all of a sudden it's not working at all, and your data's gone. And you're like, "What? Well, I thought I understood this. Well, here's what I can tell you. Google changes things all the time. But there's a little plugin that'll help you put schema onto your contact page. And you're like, ooh, that's kind of cool. Wouldn't it be nice to have that for your customers who care about local SEO? And lastly, Optimizely. How many of you have heard of Optimizely? Yeah, a lot of you. It turns out um, A-B testing, right? Maybe your customers don't even know what an A-B test is. Right? Maybe you have the kind of customer, I don't know if you've ever had this customer. I've had a couple of them where they say, just make the button orange, it works every time. And you're like, I know what article you read and it was, you know, 2010. And by the way, there's a lot more to that than that. But they're just like, just make them all orange. You're like, but your whole website's orange. Like your button just disappeared. And they're like, just make the button orange. I know it works. And you're like, okay. Right? Optimizely has incredible value if you can bring that to the table to your customers. All right, I think we're there. Courage. Courage is not the absence of fear. Right, if you're thinking that one day you're gonna wake up and you're just gonna be in power mode, I know everything, I'm ready. That was possible in 1995. I started working on the web in 1995. In 1995, there was like 16 different syntaxes you had to know to put HTML on the web and that was it. No JavaScript, no forms, no frames. It was a beautiful world. You could make anything blink. <laughs> but that world's gone. And the amount of technology you need to know to put this stuff together keeps growing and keeps increasing. You don't have to know everything. Find relationships, build partnerships and all that. But here's the bottom line. You're never going to wake up in the morning and just go, I am the master of this universe and I know everything. It's not going to happen. So you will have fear. Courage is not the lack of that fear. Courage is knowing and admitting what you know and what you don't know, admitting that you have some fear, and then saying, now how am I going to move past this? Being honest with yourself. So, as we wrap up, ask great questions. Expand your horizons. Be a constant learner. Educate your clients and ultimately delight their clients. My name's Chris Lemma. I'm the CTO and Chief Strategist at a company called Crowd Favorite where we do WordPress stuff and I blog at chrislemma.com. Thank you very much.